Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, dobre jutro, dobre dan, goede middag, goede avond. It depends where in the world you are calling from, because we truly are a global community today. We have people joining in from all over the planet, as well as attendees and speakers. My name is Isidora Katanic. I'm your virtual host together with uh, Rick today. And we would like to welcome you back to Global Azure 2020, the virtual edition. Uh, make sure you stay active with us on social media under hashtag Global Azure. And don't forget to tweet your mugs under hashtag Global Azure mug. So we are ready for our next session, which you can see is going to be very exciting. We have the Azure Stack team here with us live on the call. And I will just quickly introduce you to the, to the lineup of fantastic speakers we have joining us today. So we have the incredible Natalia Matskovicius, the head of product management uh, for Azure Stack, of whom I had the honor to meet in person uh, multiple times. And it's really an honor to have you here today, Natalia. So thank you. Uh, we have Tiberio Radu, or as we like to call him, TB. Uh, we have Javier Fernandez from the Event Hub team. We have Christopher Turner, a great friend of mine, uh, who you might know as the Texan country cloud boy on Twitter. And we're also having a customer on the call today so we can hear about his experience uh, going through this journey. So the session will be about uh, extending uh, capabilities on Intelligent Edge. We will hear, we will hear from the team uh, updates, uh, news on improvements, uh, roadmap info. We will see demos across Azure Stack Hub and uh, Azure Stack Edge. So it's going to be a very excited 45 minutes. Uh, please be active with us in the YouTube chat. You can ask your questions. And at the end of the session, Rick and I uh, will make sure to read out your questions. So dear Natalia, the stage is all yours. Thank you so much, Ade. I'm really honored to be here. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. I'm um, excited to be here to talk about the Azure Stack portfolio as well as the Intelligent Edge and so many things that we're doing um, across this portfolio that are really innovative and we hope you'll be really excited about. Um, so first I wanted to talk about just our broader hybrid edge portfolio. If you look at our broader edge portfolio, um, it starts with a single control plane. So Tibby, if you can go to, well, oh, thank you. Uh, single control plane with Azure or let's use extend AI to the edge with devices as well as Azure service. Part of that on Azure services, any infrastructure. That means not just in Azure, but also like AWS or VMware. And in with Azure Data services, what you'll see is continue to add additional services that are containerized and can be deployed anywhere using one single control plane. On the far right, we have Azure IoT. And Azure IoT allows you to do IoT capabilities, things like AI, cognitive service, run machine learning, and advanced analytics for close to the data. And then the area that I'm most excited about is how you can modernize your data centers with Azure Stack. And a lot of this goes into our intelligent edge computing, running data closest to its source, enabling you to run your services, whether those are containerized services or full cloud native applications and services in the data center and at the edge. So let's look at the hybrid offerings within the Azure Stack portfolio. Many of you have probably seen our Azure Stack system, which is the Azure Stack Hub. And we've renamed that to Azure Stack Hub because we've expanded our portfolio to include additional offerings in the Azure Stack family so you can consistently build applications and services. And that could be on-premises in a data center where you have completely air-gapped environments, or it could be for edge capabilities that you're running in branch offices or even in very rugged, remote, austere environments. I'm going to go a little bit deeper today. You're going to have a lot of additional context in Azure Stack Edge as well as Azure Stack Hub. So let me full start with Azure Stack Edge. Azure Stack Edge, it's a cloud managed appliance. So you can literally buy it from Azure. You can go into the portal and purchase a system that is a first party system. So it's a Microsoft managed appliance. And here you can run Kubernetes applications, bring that edge as well as um, to that 
education. In addition, one of the things we're really excited about is the ability to do network data transfer to the cloud. Um, so in to take an Azure first party and transfer data to Azure. And in the future, you will also be able to do that to Azure Stack Hub system. Um, let's go to the next slide, Tibby. And if you look at the Azure Stack Edge, if I go a little bit more deep Azure Stack Edge, manage the client. You can do things today like running FPGA to actually look at machine learning capabilities and run those data models. Uh, you can take things like looking at video feeds and running AI closest to the source and then only transferring data to the public cloud or even um, at Azure Stack Hub in the future. You can do edge computing. So a lot of this is some of those edge applications. You might need cognitive services, machine learning, AI capability, all of your work those needs. You can even have custom ones that you can have available. Those custom modules were available as the IoT, but then also what we're going to tell our future is also just virtual machine management support. So you can have VMs available as well as custom Kubernetes applications and services. At Ignite, so announced some additional hardware and form factors. Um, so it's an Azure machine. That storage gateway transferring Azure data to the cloud, and then in the future to the session, you'll get to see a demo by Christopher, who's going to show you some of the the Azure Stack Edge and some of the AI and machine learning capabilities that you can use in vertical. Let's go to the next slide. At Ignite, we announced some additional additional form factors for Azure Stack Edge. Did we miss one? Hold on a second. Tonight we had, we had additional form factors for Azure Stack Edge. In part, the one is more the commercial series. As I mentioned before, abilities on Stack Edge. And these are traditional form factors, one new device that you have. Um, what we're adding is NVIDIA T4 GPUs. So you can do additional machine learning and AI capabilities at the edge that we're adding, and we showcased at Ignite. Normally, I'd be able to actually show you the device, but I'm working from home, so I don't have that here. But we have rugged and portable devices. So two form factors that are coming in our rugged series. First is a larger rugged offering, which is still the one U server in a ruggedized case. So you can bring this to harsh or austere environments. Think of this as even in manufacturing or mining capability or other areas where you don't necessarily have data center space. We've even reduced the form factor to a size that it is literally you could fit in the backpack. It's about this size and you those that's also ruggedized and that preview is also coming. So we do see these as really innovative and meeting customer needs to be able to run edge computing no matter where you need that compute available. Next, I wanted to go through Azure Stack Hub. So Azure Stack Hub, many of you have probably been with us on a journey where we announced Azure Stack Hub to bring cloud native capabilities and a completely autonomous cloud to a data center or a location. So this allows you to run completely consistent hybrid cloud capabilities. They can run either connected to Azure or even fully air-gapped from the network. And we continue to innovate and provide additional applications and services for this autonomous cloud. So in most environments, we have web apps, container marketplace. We've been innovating on providing with an AKS engine. We've also, in preview, have a, many additional services like IoT Hub and Event Hubs, which Javier is going to go through and show you a demo of that. This also gives you consistent application development as well as the capability to bring marketplace content. So a lot of ISV solutions have marketplace content in Azure that can also be used on Azure Stack Hub. It's a personal integrated system, so we have it available for many different hardware providers. As this gives Azure service with a consistent development paradigm that you can run full 
fully air networks, even for regulatory and data sovereignty environments. So we're seeing this a lot in the government space. We're seeing it in manufacturing and mining, oil and gas, all these manufacturing with IoT have coming on board capabilities. We continue to round out additional services. So we're really excited about a lot of the innovation that we're doing and the ability that we will have to even migrate some sort of 2008 um, images that Tibby is going to go through. So you'll see what you can do from migrating um, end of life server 2008 and SQL 2008 um, images onto Azure Stack Hub. You'll also see A's event from Papier, some of the event hubs and the things that we're doing. We have a lot of additional services to, um, and even GPU capabilities. So not only can you do edge processing, but you can also train models on an Azure Stack Hub system. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Tibby, and he's going to go through some of the migration opportunities and things that we're doing on Azure Stack Hub. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Natalia. Um, hello, everyone. My name is uh, Tiberi Radu. I'm a program manager on the Azure Stack team. I focus on um, IaaS management, uh, migrations, and essentially what you can do with these workloads once you've migrated them on um, Azure Stack Hub. Um, as we, I gotta find the right screen. Uh, as we talk about the, the migration opportunities, um, there are various um, factors which contribute to these um, migrations. Uh, these are uh, triggers coming from things like uh, uh, hardware refreshes or compliance needs or anything like that, but also for, from uh, things like uh, software end of support. Um, this is one of the programs that was launched in uh, last year. I think in summer last year, uh, where we had uh, SQL 2008 uh, reach uh, their um, end of support. And with that, there was an extension for using uh, Azure workloads um, uh, as well as Azure Stack. Meaning if you move those VMs on Azure or Azure Stack, you would essentially get three years of, um, of free licenses or free uh, extended support updates uh, pretty much. Uh, so the, th this is a good opportunity for, for various companies to actually use um, as a trigger to migrating to the cloud. Uh, so the, the cloud, the, the transformational process itself um, has various, like, like we said, has various uh, triggers for these. Um, even if there are things like the, the hardware refresh or the, the end of support, these are the, the lift and shift um, processes themselves, where you essentially take the VMs, you move them on Azure Stack, or you move them on Azure, and then you can take advantage of the, the things enabled by the platform itself. These are things like as simple as an ARM template or things as simple as creating an NSG or RBAC to actually enable those workloads. Um, all the, the things I'm describing, I'm talking about now, I, we only have like 10 minutes, so uh, all these things uh, will be listed at the end in a uh, set of links. Um, we have written a number of blogs about this and we have a series on IaaS and how IaaS enables these um, features across the, the platform. Um, as well as there are guidances on uh, how to actually do this migration. Um, because when you're moving from uh, a traditional virtualization platform to a cloud, if that cloud is on-prem or if that is a public cloud, uh, it's still a cloud, there are certain things you need to take into consideration when you're doing this. Um, so we, we wrote uh, a number of uh, articles which talk about uh, the things to consider, the questions you should be asking, and uh, the things to take into consideration when you're doing this move itself. Um, this is an important part, though, because as you move to the, the cloud, you will have the IaaS-enabled features. Um, like I said, things as simple as RBAC or resetting a password on a um, on a virtual machine. But there, there's also opportunities for you to move to a PaaS or a serverless um, layer as well. So taking more and more advantage of the platform and taking more and more advantage of what's offered from the platform. 
Um, we, we kept talking about the traditional virtualization and, and the, the cloud. Um, I'm sure everybody knows this, but in a traditional uh, approach, essentially you are managing everything from the networking all the way to the, the actual application. While you're, when you're talking about an IaaS platform, uh, you have the, the everything from the everything up to the OS itself managed by the vendor essentially, and then you will need to manage the, the things on top. So the OS all the way up to the application. As you progress to, to the platform as a service, um, everything up to the runtime itself will be managed by the uh, vendor themselves, right? So, and when you talk about a, a SaaS, of course, everything is managed, so you just consume that application. Now, from an Azure Stack Hub perspective, um, this is what Azure Stack Hub essentially looks like. Um, you can think of it as a black box, which is um, provided from the vendor if you want, and it's um, um, tested, it's on a tried hardware, it's on validated um, hardware with all the services sort of stitched together and, and creating this platform that you can take advantage on. Even if it's something as simple as an IaaS workload or more complex things like PaaS and, and building up towards a SaaS-like environment. So from a platform perspective, these are exposed through the, the, the portal. And these are um, something you, like these services are something you, you will consume by services, like I said, even something as small as a virtual machine, all the way to things more complicated <coughs> like app services or uh, we'll go into details uh, in a few minutes. Now, from an IaaS perspective, um, um, Azure Stack at its core is an IaaS platform. And this is not um, um, an understatement. We, um, what we've seen uh, with our customers, with our existing customers, is the approach is to, to go with the lift and shift approach and then modernize those applications. Um, that can mean something as easy as creating um, a um, ARM template or uh, something more complex like re-architecting uh, the solution and taking advantage of those past services. So to um, sort of highlight these things, we, we came up with a blog series where, which you can find here. All the links will be in the next slide, I think. Um, the, the blog series goes through a number of aspects. It starts with what uh, the platform is. The second article talks about the migration process itself how you should be thinking about the migration, what to consider when you're doing the migration, as well as the uh, third-party vendors that you can use during this migration. Because uh, you will need a uh, tool to actually move those workloads and to migrate them. And we'll hear in a second from Mike uh, about their experience uh, with the migration and what they are looking for on, on this. And, uh, but in essence, these are the, the, the things enabled from the platform. Um, like I've said, uh, there are things as easy as adding a disk all the way to things more complicated like treating your infrastructure as code. Infrastructure as code is an approach where essentially you are describing your entire um, infrastructure as code. You are building ARM templates which then will get deployed from the, the platform itself. So you can apply things like a CI-CD pipeline, for example, for that infrastructure as code. So anytime you add a new disk, you should test <laughs> what happens and what breaks when you're when you're doing that. Right? So, um, of course, we don't have enough time to go through all of these, but I wanted to sort of highlight these links for, for you. Uh, these are the, the places where you will find more information across um, building a uh, practice uh, around Azure Stack Hub and starting with the foundational bits. So the, the second link in here talks about, starts from the, the slides all the way to the workshops, as well as videos which guide you through all of these things. And then uh, there are other links on, on building a practice and building a um, an entire uh, infrastructure as code approach if you want. Even if you start with something as easy as a uh, migration and lift and shift in the context of the OS or anything else, this will be a, a good place for, for you to start. Um, to give us a bit about their journey and, and how they um, uh, thought about this, I wanted to, to invite I want to invite Mike from Eversource with us. Um, they have actually uh, they are going through the migration um, as we speak, and they have uh, quite a few things to share from their end. Thank you. And Mike, thanks, Tibby. Uh, appreciate it. So, uh, as Tibby said, uh, my name is Mike Viscorsi, and let me get my presentation up here really quick. And I work for Eversource Energy, and we're based out of the Northeast. So first, I just wanted to give 
a little bit of introduction of who Eversource Energy is and who I am. So Eversource Energy. So Eversource Energy is a regulated energy company operating out of the Northeast. We provide electric, gas, and warm customers across Connecticut, Massachusetts, and New Hampshire in the United States. Uh, as I said, I'm Mike Scorsky. I'm a cloud domain architect with a focus on Azure Public Data Center integration, data center hybrid infrastructure, as well as Azure networking for Eversource. So I'm going to hop right into some of the things that Tibby talked about of why Eversource Energy chose to move forward with Azure Stack Hub. Uh, we currently have a, a decent size IaaS and PaaS footprint up in the Azure public region, and we really wanted to figure out how we can start standardizing on a single product base. And as we started to learn more about Azure Stack Hub, we found out that we could bring Azure into our data center and start leveraging IaaS and PaaS platforms, uh, more so app service, in our data center and really starting to standardize on one platform to support. And one of the big games that we saw with this one platform to support is Microsoft has made the management and the support and update process of the Azure Stack Hub truly one click um, from an operation perspective. So as Tibby said, it's a kind of black box. We went with Dell for our Azure Stack um, uh, Hub uh, uh, equipment uh, standpoint and literally gets installed when we need to upgrade this upgrade this hardware. I press a button and literally in one of the updates, it upgraded my entire system from server 2016 to server 2019 without me having to do anything other than watch it. And it worked flawlessly and I did not have one issue. That's different than your standard hyper hypervisor platforms and some other products where you have to do a lot more care and feeding and hand holding and you're going through and walking through an, up, an update of that infrastructure where Azure Stack Hub like I said, literally pressed a button and it literally rebuilt my whole hub uh, in the matter of a day or two. So that was that's really impressive and really simplifies that process. Now, being that we're a regulated industry, we'll never achieve 100% cloud only footprint. What we like to say here is we're not cloud first, we're cloud right. So we need to figure out what's the right spot for our workloads uh, in relation to cloud. So what Azure Stack Hub does in bringing Azure into our data center is it, it allows us to bring some of these legacy technologies, the legacy platforms, as to be, to be stated, like these server 2008 platforms, up into the Azure um, environment, specifically now with Azure Stack Hub in our data center. So we are actually starting to move some of our 2008 workloads into Azure Stack Hub, which also is giving us some of that extended support and security and patch support for the next three years, which helps from a cost saving and from a security perspective. Um, around migration and modernization, as, as Tibby spoke about, you have to migrate your workloads onto Azure Stack Hub. So like we did with our Azure public environment, we're also going with a lift and shift model, shift model to our Azure, Azure Stack Hub environment. That's really the easiest way for us to migrate and show the value of Azure Stack Hub with the least amount of risk. So initially, we're going to look at migrating our server 2008, server 2016, for 2016 IS workloads across a dev, test, and prod environment into the Azure Stack Hub. Now we have enabled and installed the uh, app service as resource provider in Azure Stack Hub, and we will look to in the future to try to start lifecycling some of these IaaS web applications in uh, PaaS based applications to leverage across Azure Stack Hub and Azure Public. Uh, we are leveraging a third party product called Beam to help us with our migration from our existing hypervisor on prem into Azure Stack Hub. Now, around the modernization, this is, I think, one of the best things that we can prove on how standardizing on Azure as a platform is really going to help us modernize our data center, whether it be up in the public cloud space or in our on-premise data with Azure Stack Hub. Some of the cool things that we've been able to leverage that have helped us modernize is Azure Automation. So we're able to leisure, led, uh, leverage Azure Automation accounts. And Azure Stack Hub supports hybrid worker servers to push automation from Azure Public down to Azure Stack Hub. So one of the things that we wanted to do, for example, was be able to shut servers down on a nightly basis in Azure Stack Hub to avoid incurring costs when we don't need to use some of our dev and test workloads. Now, even though that feature isn't natively available in Azure Stack Hub, we're able to leverage existing Azure automation accounts that we have in Azure Public. Existing run books with just a little bit of uh, modification and push those run books to our hybrid worker and we're able to auto shut down and auto power up our servers in Azure Stack Hub just like we do in Azure Public. So really standardizing across one type of automation platform, one type of automation process across our public and on-prem data centers. 
And as Tibby talked about earlier from uh, ARM template deployment, we're also able to leverage some of our existing ARM templates to deploy VMs via PowerShell directly into Azure Stack Hub. And now with the release of Azure Stack uh, Update 2002, there's a preview for the Azure AZ modules, which is very exciting for us because most people in template deployment for Azure. And now we're going to be looking to standardize uh, not only our our automation, also, our build process across our Azure Public Environment and Azure Stack Hub. So, really, what this is doing is we're able to modernize our data center on prem and try to keep it we're doing in Azure Public, hence, standardizing our automation, cutting down on support, cutting down on overhead. And I'll be honest, I am very excited to see what Azure Stack Hub can do now and in the future. So, it's just a little story of whatever sort of Stack Hub for. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, the uh, some of these services that, as Mike described, some of these services are able to sort of run across uh, Azure as well as Azure um, Stack Hub. So you have a hybrid approach. But in some cases, uh, there is a need to have the the fast service itself running on um, Azure Stack Hub. So Javier uh, will join us next to uh, talk about the the running event hubs on Azure Stack and and what that that means. And Javier, you can share your screen, please. Absolutely. So, um, uh, uh, welcome everyone. Um, I'm the PM for Azure Messaging, and we are behind the messaging services on Azure on Azure Stack Hub, like uh, Event Hub, Service Bus, Event Grid, and Relay. Uh, we recently released Event Hubs on Azure Stack Hub as a preview. The case Event Hubs. It is a, there is Event Hub on Azure and even Hub on Azure Stack Hub. It is exactly the same operational experience, the same APIs, the same SDKs, our templates, um, Power, PowerShell support. So um, you don't, uh, th that is that is a commonizing the way that you work with the, the, the paths is a great advantage. It's, it will, and this is touches on the same thing, uh, the, the same U, UX and API. So what you see here, side by side, is an ex user experience, graphical user interface for creating an event hub cluster. On the left is on an Azure Stack Hub. On the right is on Azure Event Hubs. You see, they are the same. The only uh, variation is when it makes sense. So those some pricing tiers that on uh, Stack Hub on, on Azure that applies on on Stack Hub is really is is your is your is, is your box. You also, 10 cores, you need to know, uh, being mindful of when you are deploying a cluster, how many cores you are going to consume. Uh, on Azure, a user doesn't care about that. It's, it's, it's uh, us who are going to be pointing up the, the cores. So that doesn't exist, but it's basically the same experience. Also, an ex uh, something that is, is uh, a benefit is avoid expenses for managing licensed software. When we created the Bing Hubs, there is a lot of um, a, a software that goes into that with different types of licenses. Even open source, we use open source in, in our products. Managing all that, you don't need to worry about that. The provider of the past service needs to do that. And, and, and you just manage probably at, at most the, the, the past service license, just one, but not the potentially tens or hundreds of licenses. Oculus plus a past service, it's event hubs. Um, and, and, and you can see the, 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 the letters, the messaging. Event hub is a streaming engine. Uh, however, it can be also used for um, event-driven architectures. Um, and so those are the main use cases. So if you want to deploy modern applications, event-driven with um, event sourcing patterns, uh, data uh, event stored, event hubs is is um, is, is the kind of um, a, a, a message broker that you can use on a stack hub. Um, if you are uh, need some typical streaming applications, for example. Uh, a, you have you want to uh, analyze the sentiment of tweets, and in event hubs on the Stack Hub can ingest millions of tweets per second, millions, really million, uh, uh, 
uh, many megabytes per second, 100 megabytes per second, has a, yeah, and that is with the, the, the um, smallest cluster site. So it has a, a big capacity for ingestion and for egress, um, also similar. It's actually more. Um, so in, in this case, on-premises, on your stack hub, on the left-hand side, you ingest that through event hubs, and you can have uh, 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 that uh, tweets being processed with this own sentinel analysis um, model, and then results uh, put in on storage, or results aggregated data can be sent to Azure for further processing and storage visualization. So one interesting thing is that event hubs um, support the Kafka protocol. So if you decide to, you, you want to use open source software, the, the cloud native application, and, and you, don't, you don't want to be using even our SDKs, the event hub SDK, you can use the Kafka SDKs and, and it, because we have even the Kafka protocol support. So uh, you don't need to worry about creating the clusters for, for Kafka and maintaining that. It's it, it, we we do it for you. So um, that is one thing that um, that is it is a great advantage. Okay, so a very quick demo of uh, what is what is event hops. Um, what you see here is the even Azure Stack Hub. This is the Dash Stack Hub, and, and it is exactly the same or very, very similar to Azure. This feels like Azure is really your private cloud on your stack hub. And I have created some resources. Uh, yeah, among them is an event hub cluster. So we'll go into that. An event hub cluster, you can create a namespace that is like a container of things in, in event hubs. And what are those things? So there are event hubs. Uh, and we're gonna go there to one namespace that I already have created. Uh, and we go in hubs. The event hubs are the entities, the things in event hub that contain the events. That is going to be the the ingested events are going to go into this e e event. And I have created a very simple application just to showcase there is a trade book order simulation in which we are bidding for the stocks. I have started the consumer that is in, blo in blue, you can see, and it's ready to receive events. Now we need to push. Um, those uh, events, and we're going to generate JSON um, bits objects, and we're sending. And what you're seeing here, switching me consumer. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, this is a consumer, and the green one is the publisher. And we have finished. So we we just sent two thousand uh, events, and the consumer already consumed those. Um, so this is just one simple example. Obviously, in a real-life application, it's much more complex than that, um, but I just wanted to showcase that. Another thing that I want to show you is the event hubs, uh, Azure Stack Hub has an admin experience. Uh, so what you saw until now is the user experience, the developer experience. This is the administrator experience. And we can you see your alerts related to the event hubs that you have how many event hubs cluster you have created. In this case, I have one. And then so there is some uh, uh, quota experience in which is a way for you to limit the consumption of resources by any given service, any given pass, in this case, event hubs. Right now, it's just 10 cores, which is the, the minimal cluster size that we are limiting. We're defining this quota that is really applicable for users to, uh, to up to that limit. So that is basically my demo. Um, I hope you have learned something. Uh, and with that, um, a, a Chris Turner is going to be a start a transition to Chris Turner. To he's going to be talking about Azure Stack Edge, Azure Stack Hub, and other devices to connect, uh, uh, collect data. Thanks, Javier. Can you see my screen? Hopefully. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Okay. I okay. just want to think. Thanks, Javier. Um, 
Um, so my demo today. So my demo today. Okay, I'm going to be showing how okay, to I'm going to be showing how to develop a customer IoT. Sorry about this. Sorry about this. I'm new to PowerPoint. I'm new to PowerPoint. So my demo today. I'm going to be. So my demo today. I'm going to be showing how to develop some how to develop some custom IoT custom IoT modules that will support our data staging and our our applications. I'm using these IoT. I'm using these IoT solutions. So we could transform the data. We could transform the data from Azure Stack Edge from Azure Stack Edge for advanced deployment for advanced deployment for for example for for example images we could scrub images first. Um, remove remove like uh, GPS information, like another information, another private data, 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 another uh, several services in Azure Cloud, uh, for instance, Azure Container Registry and IoT Hub. We're, we are going to take advantage of uh, the custom vision service, but we're actually going to bring that down as a module and run that and deploy that over to uh, our IoT Edge device, which our IoT Edge device is um, Azure Stack Edge. Um, <clears throat> we'll have four modules that we'll deploy today, um, which I'll go, I'm going to go to kick that off now. Give me one second. <clears throat> So I'm going to pop over to uh, Visio Studio Code, and I'm going to actually deploy. Actually, I'm going to start the build, and I'm going to actually start the push of these uh, of these images now because um, it's going to take. It might take some time, and I I want to make sure I finish before the demo's over. So while they uh, <clears throat> while these uh, images are being built, they're all going to they're going to be then pushed up to uh, ACR, and from there we could actually deploy them to our uh, Edge de IoT Edge devices, which in our case is uh, Azure Stack Edge. Um, the modules that we're going to be using, that I'm building today, are, are three simple modules. The first one is a file copy module. It's a C Sharp uh, module. And basically, this, this module is, it allows uh, the IoT Edge module to move files in Azure Stack uh, Edge um, <coughs> um, from different shares and then out to uh, different storage accounts. Um, the second module we're building is uh, the capture image module. This module is uh, basically a simulation. Um, normally, we have like five feeds coming in of, of, of video feeds of, of various things like traffic or parking garages, um, or you have some kind of solution where images are constantly being fed. But for this demo, all I'm doing is a simple image of a sheep and her, and, and this is uh, Spaz, the sheep, and this is um, Kevin, the uh, lamb. And what this is going to do, this capture, this uh, camera capture module is end up going to uh, push this image as if it was a live stream to my classifier module. Um, the classifier module is based off of uh, custom vision um, uh, that we're going to, I'm going to show you in a second. And that classifier module is going to hopefully identify that image that is a sheep. Um, so I'm going to switch over to uh, the uh, custom vision. This is actually in the cloud right now. And this is how you're going to train this module, <coughs> this classifier. So I've uh, I created a project called Edge Sheep Classifier, and I've uploaded a, a lot of images and uh, different images from from stock images. And some of these images are my images of my donkeys and cows and, and sheep. And we tag them either sheep, cows, donkeys, etc. And we we train it. Um, we train the uh, we train this by. Uh, and then, uh, and the more you train it, the smarter the, uh, the the service is going to be. And then, at one point, once we're done training, we're going to export this back down to our development box, and then we're going to build a module that we could then deploy to our edge. And then everything is actually done on the edge and not in the cloud. Um, what I'm going to do is kind of an example of what we're going to expect on the edge, but this is actually being done right now within the actual service on in the cloud. So we're going to just pop in. An image, and right now, our uh, the, the intelligence says that yes, this is ninety nine percent chance that this is going to be a sheep. So that's a good thing, right? We know that it's a sheep. That's great. So now we've exported this and we moved it back down to um, our develop machine, and we're creating. Um, <clears throat> we're going to create the modules as I said. We've already built them out. I've already kind of cheated and have um have actually had the modules built and have have the have the data already uh, deployed to my ACR because that would have took about 10 or 15 minutes. So the next step that I'm going to take is I'm actually going to deploy 
all these modules as one solution to my Azure Stack Edge um, device. I've already created my deployment manifest. So all I need to do is actually deploy my deployment manifest. And I could do this in various ways. I could do this from Visio Code. I could go to the portal and I could manually import these modules one at a time. Um, but to be honest, this is probably the easiest way and the fastest way. Um, if I, I'm only going to do a single device. I only have one uh, Azure Stack Edge. Um, but let's say in a solution where I had a thousand edges, I owned a whole bunch of oil. Um, I was an oil company and I had edges spread out across the country um, and I needed to get this module deployed. I would actually create the deployment at scale. That way I could deploy across to multiple uh, things over time. So I'm going to do a single device. I'm going to pick my edge and then <coughs> deployment is successful. So at this point, we, it's going to take a few minutes. I'm going to keep talking and uh, and, and hopefully entertain you guys. But um, I'm also going to uh, show through Azure PowerShell. Yeah. By the way, happy birthday, Thomas. <laughs> you like that, That right? was so cute. Uh, 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 so I'm going to uh, just uh, check that my uh, containers are running now on my edge and see how long they've been up. Um, a few seconds of these. So they're all running okay. And I could also check... Um, <coughs> in IoT Hub. IoT Hub is where we're going to manage all these modules that are running on our IoT, our, uh, our Azure Stack Edge. So as you can see, we have um, the four modules now running. We have the, the log spout is a, um, is a, is a third part, I see, is a, a solution from a Microsoft uh, employee who, with this, it actually ingests the uh, logs from the containers and ingest them, ingest them up to uh, log analytics. So that way we could get a better view and a single view of, of all the errors if we had errors. Here's our file copy monitor. Everything has been deployed. Everything is reporting in and everything is running successfully. Um, if we wanted to get deeper um, into some of these things, we could get like the classifier and we could actually make sure that, um, wrong example, make sure that uh, <coughs> some of the um, environmental options actually match what we're supposed to match. This is what we want. This is what's reporting. So we know that exactly everything is working fine and and, and dandy. So now that I've talked to you about um, the, we kind of scanned through the uh, the modules really fast. Uh, the, and we kind of scanned through how fast, I mean, how to deploy these modules. And um, now we kind of want to go through and see if this module actually was six full, if, if this, if this was actually a successful demo and it actually could identify if this was a sheep or not, right? Um, and, and, and I want to give you a quick one minute roundup of why this is kind of important. For if, in, in my solution, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about my, my area. I, I live on a small farm in Texas. I, it's not very big. It's 14 acres. But um, let's, let's, go, let's make this scale. Let's make this a, a huge corporate, a corporate ranch, corporate farm, and they need to be able to monitor Field health. They need to be able to monitor their, their their livestock and stuff. For me, I'm playing with this. It's a it's a it's a, it's kind of a thing that I could go out. I could take my drone. I could scan all four of my pastures. I could I could bring that that data, those images. I could tell where my sheep are. I could tell where my my cows are, where my donkeys are. I could actually ingest all that stuff into a tool, another Azure service called Azure Farm Beats, and I could manage the health of my crops and my farm, and I could know which pasture is the most healthiest for my cows to move to next and then my sheep to follow. So all this stuff kind of comes together as one big, um, well, one big solution that is very, uh, very, very valuable to, to solutions like uh, farmers and ranchers. And, and then we could also talk about oil industry and all that other stuff. So uh, the deployment as you, um, so let me get to my change lot there. Okay. <clears throat> so we're done. Let's go over to our, um, we've got the modules running. I want to make sure that um, that we're going to be able to see the um, the results. So I'm running a quick query, and what I'm going to be looking for, and sorry for being so small here, we're going to look for a classifier. As you can see, the classifier is cropping the image. It's it's got the image from the ca the, the camera capture module has sent the image over to my classifier. Now I'm going to look for a message that tells me that the classifier has identified um, <coughs> the, uh, the object and, and it proved that this either works or, so here's, here's one here. Let's see what it does. So this one here is basically telling me that it predicts 
that it's a probability that it's a cow. So something's not right, right? So I got to go back and oh, uh, higher probability that it's a cow versus the donkey versus, but it does have a high probability that it thinks it's sheep too. So just to give you a, so what I need to do is actually go back into my uh, classifier and, and train it more, give it more images, um, give it various images of, of more donkeys and cows and sheep. And, and, and the smarter that classifier is, the better the prediction is going to be. So at the end of the day, at the end of the day, um, it, at least it knows that it's either a donkey, cow, or sheep, right? That's, which is which is uh, which is moving forward. I mean, this is all this is all pretty cool technology for me. Um, we got the solution developed, and another another side, another the the I'm going to go back to the file copy solution real fast before I end this. The file copy solution that I I created assists people like myself um, <coughs> or people who have around the room with very, very limited bandwidth. So I have these big images, these big videos from my drone and these images that are coming in and I'm storing them on an SMB share within uh, my, on my uh, Microsoft Edge, my, my Azure Stack Edge. And I have a couple of shares with that uh, file copy. That file copy is going to assist in based off triggers. Anytime anything's written to my local share on my Edge, it's gonna replicate, it's gonna move it over to my cloud share on my Edge. And then from that, it's going to slowly sync up to uh, a storage account, either on Azure Stack Hub or Azure, depending on where you want that target to be, um, all based off triggers. And then for me, I have very limited bandwidth out here, so I have some bandwidth controls. Um, so during the day, the day when I'm working and I'm moving images or something like that, my kids aren't going to yell at me because they can't stream or they can't, um, you know, all the kids stuff that they do. So in a nutshell, that's my demo on sheep or not the sheep, as I call it, and uh, I will pass it on. Wonderful, thank you so much on time. You're, you're almost Swiss, uh, Chris, that's very, uh, very <laughs> punctual. Thank you. Um, so thank you everyone. We do have questions coming in, which I would, uh, I would, would like to ask you. We have a couple more minutes uh, on the show. And to start with you, uh, Natalia, is the ARC model the future for an increasing amount of Azure services on-prem, and how does it fit with Stack Hub? Thanks for the question. Oh, let me put my video back on. Yeah, there we go. So um, ARC and Azure Stack and then the Azure Stack family are actually really complementary. If you look at ARC has the capability, so one of the, it's for some containerized services to be available. So we're, we are seeing a trend for many customers to start using containerized services, but there still is a need to run full pass services and to be able to run where in environments where you need full cloud capability. So that entirely consistent development experience that we saw with Eversource. Um, so if you look at the Azure Stack family and the edge computing that we're doing, um, Azure Stack Edge gives you some of that computing closest to its source. We can actually create an entire offline disconnected ecosystem with Azure Stack Hub and Azure Stack Edge that can run fully air-gapped from the network as well. With Azure Stack Hub, you actually have the control plane on-premises, so it allows you to run services like event hubs, and we've got IoT Hub in, in preview. We've got um, things like blogs, tables, queues and the AKS engine coming on board. So there's there's a lot more robust functionality because you have the full cloud control plane. But Arc gives you that capability to run a lot of those containerized services wherever you need to, regardless if it's in Azure, another public cloud, different infrastructure, or even on HCI. Um, we didn't talk a lot about Azure, HC, Azure Stack HCI, but even on Azure Stack HCI. So I, I really view them as very complementary. You can even run, you'll be able to run the Arc services on Azure Stack Hub as well. Okay. Thank you very much for uh, answering our community question. Then I have the next one uh, for you, Tibi. Um, there are still some differences between Azure Stack Hub and Azure Cloud. Some are expected, like the lag in resource provider API versions, other are more sharp edged, like Azure Stack PowerShell. What does the roadmap uh, look like for addressing some of the paper cuts that can hinder development of solutions running across both Azure and Stack Hub? 
That is a complicated question. Um, <laughs> the, the, the short answer to this is we are working on bringing more and more capabilities across the, the Azure Stack Hub itself, um, be that from the, the PowerShell modules all the way to actual services which are running on top of Azure Stack Hub, right? Um, consistency is the, the one of the, the key points uh, for Azure Stack Hub. So having a um, cloud running on premises, essentially. Um, so things like the API versions and uh, the these, these improvements are, are going to follow as well. So with every update, you, you're going to see more and more of these features um, sort of making their way in. OK. Thank you, uh, TB. Uh, Chris, uh, the next one we have for you, where does farm animals yours? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> that, that, that's not the question, but I do want to know. Yeah, most of those most of those images were my farm animals. <clears throat> okay. The first few that you saw in the uh, training were, were stock because I needed to get more of it. Uh, so it was, all those, I have a lot of sheep and a lot of cows and a lot of donkeys. Yeah, yeah. OK, so thanks for sharing those. So the real question uh, we got is the rocked form factor for uh, Stack Edge or a new offering. How are customers using those devices and what other challenges come with solutions that uh, need that kind of bulletproof equipment? Is that for me? Yes. Oh boy, um, that's a good question. Um, I know. Um, for example, we might have uh, well, one of the customers that that, that uh, TV has on us now is an energy company. So we have energy companies that are spread throughout the country that that may need some of the uh, devices at the edge that are in these small rural co-ops. So these edge devices would sit <clears throat> at these small rural co-ops and be able to either report back data to either Azure or on Azure Stack Hub at, at a larger facility, especially when it comes to regulatory and, and things from um, government regulatory and stuff. So these things, I, I would see energy companies as a big uh, use case. Um, oil industry, of course, when you're out, yeah. out these rigs and you have all these this imaging that needs to be processed there at the edge, that's another use case as well. Okay. TV might do, be able to. Yeah. I, I have a little bit more context there. If you look at, with Azure Stack Edge, it's really about um, doing processing closest to its source. So, you know, Chris Pratt, great demo of looking at his um, his custom vision modules and doing AI machine learning. As you get to the ruggedized form factors, there are so many places where you, where you get to, they don't necessarily have full data center capabilities. Um, so like you mentioned, Christopher, there's oil and gas. If you look at on oil rigs or some of those locations where could be at very remote locations, there's other like manufacturing, if you've got mining, Mining, if you're in a mine shaft, um, there is a need to do some processing of data if they might want to look at all IoT and sensors from everything from the conveyor belt do some on some of the, the, the things they're mining. There's um, even health care, getting into some healthcare locations are actually in really remote locations. So you might need to have those ruggedized form factors there. So we're seeing it across a multitude of different industries and verticals. Um, from retail to manufacturing to mining to um, oil and gas to farming. But those ruggedized form factors allow you to bring the processing in places that you normally would not be able to because of either network latency or you could have the um, harsh environments from a temperature perspective to just even locations where you don't have full data center capabilities. Thank you so much for, uh, for adding the answer. Uh uh, to that question. Uh, so if we still have, yeah, we have still Mike on the call. So we have a question for you. As a real customer, how have you found the experience of deploying, managing, and maintaining Azure Stack Hub? And how do you present the surface to your internal users? Is it self-surface or is it more managed? Ooh, that's a good question. <laughs> so the one thing I can say that we have learned is we're kind of now the Azure administrators. So when you're leveraging Azure Public, you're really relying on Microsoft to kind of be your Azure administrator. So I will say a little bit of learning curve is just really trying to understand how you want to lay out your Azure Stack Hub subscription and really understanding 
how you want to leverage it. That, that probably was one of the, I wouldn't say it was a challenge. It was an amazing learning experience, right? And, yeah. you know, I'll be honest, we couldn't have done this without Microsoft. I mean, people like Tibby and my, my global black belt, Dwayne, they were with us like hand in hand. I even got to speak with Natalia at Ignite to understand and have them help understand some of the challenges we were facing or just, you know, some, some areas we needed help on and they helped. But really, it was just understanding that we're the Azure administrator now. You're responsible for patching it looking at the resources, making sure that you, you understand how your Azure Stack Hub is performing. And that's probably the best way that I can answer that question. Yeah. Awesome. Just, Thank just you. Uh, a, Thank you, Mike. Just as a, just as a quick shameless plug, uh, the learning, uh, the learnings and the, the things to sort of ramp up, uh, if you look at the links uh, that I showed, all of those will go into details on how to do that and how to uh, raise your operator muscle if you want.